Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Folkman. I'm a Senior Director of Product here at RMS. And I am joined by Daniel Gorham. He's a research engineer at IBHS, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. We have some uh, great turnout today, and we're excited to be sharing some insight on wildfire risk, hazard, and mitigation over the course of the next hour. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First, uh, if you would like to, a to uh, ask a question, please do so using the Q&A bar uh, on your screen through the Zoom client. Uh, all of those questions will go to us and we're gonna leave uh, about 20 minutes at the very end for what I hope to be a very robust Q&A. Uh, so we are monitoring that. Um, and then second, a, a recording of this webinar as well as the slides will be made available uh, after the presentation to clients of RMS and IBHS. Uh, so with that out of the way, I'm gonna advance the slide. Um, uh, this is a quick agenda of what we'll be covering today. First, uh, I will be talking about the drivers of risk in the wildfire uh, severity that we have been observing over the past couple of seasons and then the modeling process, both the challenges that we face as well as the opportunities for better risk management uh, across all of the components of a wildfire model, hazard, vulnerability, and then most importantly, mitigation and what we can do to insulate ourselves uh, from this risk. And then Daniel is going to talk a little bit about ignition mechanisms in more detail, as well as safe and resilient building components and materials. And as I mentioned, we will leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So I'm going to start by showing a simple graphical illustration of, I think, why we are all here today. There is an alarming trend in the severity of loss over the past 50 years in North America, um, where from the 1960s to about 1990, wildfire was not that big a deal to the insurance industry, resulting in less than $100 million a year and that's 2019 dollars of insured loss to the industry. But then something changed in the 90s, starting with the Oakland Hills fire and in the beginning of the new millennium, an outbreak of very severe fires in Southern California. And then something changed again over about the last decade. Now there are several factors driving these trends, which we're gonna to review today, but one thing is for certain is that the industry needs to get more serious about risk management and analytics for this very concerning peril, such that it is, it is measured and monitored and quantified with the same amount of rigor as for other comparable cat perils, like hurricane and earthquake and hail and flood. Uh, and I don't think the industry has quite arrived yet, but I think there is opportunity uh, to do so over the next couple of years. Uh, given the size of the loss that we're seeing, Wildfire can be considered a peak peril in parts of the Western US and it must be treated as such. So let's talk about the drivers of risk. First, exposure. Quite simply, there are more houses, there is more population and more value at risk in the wildland urban interface or what we call the WUI. Uh, it's the high fire danger area of the US. Now, this zone, uh, the WUI, is typically used to designate areas of high risk. There's a specific a technical definition of what it is. But basically, in layman's terms, it's where the wildland and populated areas mix together. These are very desirable places to live. They offer easy access to nature with all the amenities uh, of urban areas, and they're somewhat affordable uh, compared to dense urban areas. The population in these areas, particularly in the US, is growing. So that means that fires 30 years ago that would have resulted in minimal damages today are resulting in pretty significant damages. And that is important uh, to know. Another driver of risk is the amount of burnable vegetation that we have today in today's fuel landscape. <clears throat> the North American continent has uh, a denser abundance of flammable vegetation today than it did a century ago. Today's forests are more spatially uniform um, and that's ideal for fire spread conditions. 
Um, and all of this is at least partially due to aggressive fire suppression in the 20th century. I don't know if any of you remember uh, or are familiar with Smokey the Bear. He is the face of aggression, aggressive fire suppression uh, in the 20th century, where in the federal lands there was a 10 a.m. rule where all fires needed to be extinguished by 10 a.m. the next morning. Well, uh, when you had, for a, the better part of a century, an absence of more holistic forestry policies and a lack of controlled burns and forestry thinning, this led to the buildup of lots of burnable vegetation, and that has since been fixed. Uh, we have now recognized more balanced forestry policies, but there is still an excess of vegetation, and there will be for some time. Now, I won't deny that uh, this topic has recently been the subject of some very charged political narrative, uh, and the discourse has been somewhat oversimplified, and I believe statistics have been uh, selectively used, to say the very least. Suffice to say there is some very good research and policy making in the US with the US Forestry Service, part of the USDA, in Canada with NRCAN. Both organizations are actively addressing the problems of elevated fire risk, and both are seeking optimal solutions and mitigation strategies that work the best. So they're doing great jobs, and uh, we hope to leverage a lot of their research in the insurance industry going forward. Um, the third important contributor to wildfire severity uh, is that we have a change in climate. Every major wildfire starts with one or more ignitions. And an ignition requires specific conditions to be met to be successful. The vegetation has to be dry. The temperatures have to be high. There needs to be low ambient moisture in the environment, and there needs to be sustained wind, not just gusty wind, but sustained wind to turn an ignition into a full-blown catastrophic fire. Now, as we face warmer temperatures and hotter, drier summers and more frequent extreme weather conditions, these lead to knock-on effects like tree mortality that you see uh, in this slide and longer fire seasons, all of this together means that we are going to face in the long term more ignitions and bigger fires. So with this as the context, this is how we propose approaching the quantification of wildfire risk. We start with a 50,000 year climate simulation. And as I mentioned, certain conditions yield ignition points. Ignitions tend to happen more frequently in the proximity of roads and population centers. Um, and then each ignition is fed through a very high resolution fire spread simulation, where a fire behaves according to wind and fuel, slope, terrain, moisture, um, and that yields uh, millions and millions of fire footprints. The next thing that we do is consider the vulnerability and mitigation through construction, defensible space, uh, different types of roofing materials, cladding, decking, venting, and a lot of the stuff that Daniel's going to speak to you about today. Um, and all of this information yields insight. That insight can be used at the point of underwriting. It can be used for pricing, for reinsurance purchasing, for portfolio management. And that is what we hope to change the game on over the next couple of years to enable better strategies. Now, while this seems like a fairly straightforward framework, uh, it is pretty complicated in the execution. Um, a wildfire model is simply a collection of other models that are aggregated together. Smoke needs to be simulated separately because it leads to contents, claims, additional living expense evacuation. Embers, embers are the way that fires jump rivers and roads. They're burning chunks of fuel, they're carried by the wind, and by some estimates, they account for more than 90% of structural ignitions. And then urban conflagration. Urban conflagration, I'll talk about a little, but is the way where uh, a fire burns in neighborhoods instead of the wildlands, and they can be devastating. And then the financial model, finally. On the reinsurance side of the business, they are talking about changing the definition of a wildfire event, depending on certain hours and certain radii. And it's very important to quantify the impact of that. So a, how a fire ignites and spreads and causes damage is inherently complex. And quite frankly, it takes a huge amount of computational capacity 
to characterize a fire's behavior accurately. There are three components of wildfire hazard, the, the radiant heat or the flames, the burning embers and the smoke. And you can see here, these are a little bit of the variables, some of the variables that interact in order to determine these measures of hazard. <clears throat> For example, heat hazard or the flame depends on what's burning. If it's a canopy fire burning trees or if it's burning grass, that differs the fire behavior. What's the terrain? What's the fuel? How fast is the fire spreading and how intensely it is burning? These are all things that are considered in characterizing the fire hazard. Embers, the burning chunks of fuel, they can be as big as pine cones. They can be as small as one of your fingernails. But how they are created and how far they travel and what damage they do downwind depends a lot on the fuel regime and the climate conditions. And then finally, smoke, as I mentioned. Smoke causes a lot of damage. So when we run our models, it, it classifies either burn damage or smoke damage. Um, and we enable various sensitivities on that. So that's a lot of words in a slide. Let's look at this visually a little bit. Um, all of those factors that I just talked about on the pre previous slide influence wildfire risk and behavior. This is a house in the Cascade Mountains uh, that was surrounded by a wildfire just a, a couple of years ago. And you can see these are all the geohazard and the hazard characteristics that combine to determine how this fire is going to impact this structure. The intensity of the heat, the slope, the distance of the house to flammable vegetation, the rate of fire spread, the smoke, all of this stuff. Now, in hindsight, uh, you would think the homeowner could have done a better job with vegetation management uh, at the periphery of his or her house in hindsight, but in fact, when you look at how this house fared in this fire, it was just fine. And this underscores the randomness of fire behavior. And this is the reason that we as modelers have to simulate millions and millions of fires over tens of thousands of years in order to converge on really getting it right with fire modeling. And once you set up a model and you start running it for 50,000 years, then patterns start emerging. And those patterns can be used for a lot of insight in underwriting, in mitigation, and in risk reductions. And that's how we approach measuring this very, very difficult peril. Now, as I mentioned, uh, embers uh, contribute significantly to fire damage. And the reason that they're important, Daniel's gonna go into a lot of detail on this, is that embers can cause damage far beyond the perimeter of the fire itself. Uh, you can see here on the right side of the slide, this is the Wenatchee fire, where the, the fire itself stopped burning at the top of the hill, where it sort of destroyed that first row of houses. But the, the embers themselves were picked up by the fire, by this convective updraft of the fire, and they were carried downwind and they landed on houses far away. And those houses were destroyed, even though they weren't even in the proximity uh, of the footprint of the fire. And that is important to explicitly simulate in catastrophe modeling because uh, field research indicates that embers can travel multiple kilometers downwind in the right conditions. Um, you know, when embers in canopy fires and tree fires travel, uh, they land on recipient fuel and they, they do one or two things. They either start new fires downwind, and that's called fire spotting, or they start burning houses in types of urban conflagrations. Now, the fire spotting phenomenon was first uh, studied in the 1940s, and it's now an, act, an area of very active research. Um, ember travel is influenced by what's burning, the moisture, and of course the winds. And again, embers are the way that fires jump roads and rivers and start new fires. And it is very un, uh, important to uh, understand and quantify them in fire modeling. Um, now on the vulnerability side, I don't wanna steal Daniel's thunder too much, but I think this slide is incredibly cool. And it is the IBHS's research facility in South Carolina where they take various types of houses and they subject them to the ember blaster. And they see uh, what works in terms of mitigation and what doesn't work. And we were very happy to be partner with the IBHS in building out this part of our model. 
of ember vulnerability because it's incredibly important stuff. So um, one of the first real wildfire super cats, as I will call it, a super cat, occurred in, in October 2017 with uh, the wine country fires in Napa and Sonoma. Um, to date, around $11 billion of insured losses has, has been caused by these three fires that were burning simultaneously. The biggest fire, uh, as you can see here, was the Tubbs fire. It started up in the hills above town. It, it was pushed by the wind down into the town of Santa Rosa. Each one of these red dots represents a destroyed structure. And as the fire approached town, it started taking out entire neighborhoods. Now, around three o'clock in the morning, the fire approached the 101 highway, which is this uh, the gray bar that you, the gray line that you see running through the town of Santa Rosa. It's a pretty big natural fire break, four lanes of traffic on each side plus a shoulder. So you would think that kind of natural barrier, fire barrier would stop a fire. But because of the huge concentration of embers and because of the very intense winds, those embers traveled up and over the highway. They started landing on tops of roofs in the Coffee Park neighborhood across the highway at three o'clock in the morning. And by 4.30 in the morning, just 90 minutes later, this is what the Coffee Park neighborhood looked like. This is an aerial view of the neighborhood taken right after the fire. And it was about $1.5 billion of exposure that burned in 90 minutes because of the intensity of this fire. And this was the wake up call for the United States Property and Casualty Insurance Agency, for the simple uh, insurance industry, for the simple reason that this neighborhood was considered low risk by all the maps, by all the data products, by all the analytics, it was considered low risk. All of these houses were in the private admitted market. It was not excess and surplus risk. These were not fair plan insured homes. This was considered really low risk stuff. It was outside the wildland urban interface. It was outside Cal Fire high hazard zones. So what happened? And this is when the industry said, we need to get a better handle on what is really driving this kind of risk. So uh, the final important component I just wanna cover uh, of wildfire hazard is smoke, and it's often overlooked. It is too important to ignore because smoke can contribute 20, 30% or more to an individual event loss. And there are three steps to simulating the, the dispersion of uh, smoke and how it damages houses. The first one is the emission model. What's burning and how uh, quickly and intensely it's burning determines how much smoke is gonna be created. The second is dispersion, uh, smoke travels up and then it travels out. And then finally the footprint. Smoke travels really far, but the amount of smoke that's going to result in an insurance claim, an insurance claim is, is very specific. We worked with fire and smoke experts to calibrate this part of the model. We collected a lot of claims data to be able to substantiate it, um, but the damaging smoke is a lot closer to the fire footprint. Uh, then smoke actually travels, which can be hundreds or thousands of kilometers. But this is just a reconstruction of the Cedar Fire in 2003, a very severe event. We collected a lot of claims data to, to put this one back together uh, and use uh, satellite imagery and some fire data from, uh, from Cal Fire and their perimeters. But you can see this very devastating fire started in the, in the mountains above San Diego. It traveled into a very heavily populated area in San Diego. The smoke blanketed uh, uh, thousands and thousands of homes. Um, this is the smoke footprint that you can see. Um, it was a very, very heavily populated area of San Diego County. Um, but you can see that the smoke changed directions after about the third day of the fire. The smoke was pushed uh, from, uh, from town. The winds reversed directions. Um, and the more common sea breeze coming off the Pacific took hold and it pushed the smoke from San Diego all the way back into the mountains where there are relatively few structures and people. But on either side of the burn footprint, the, the damaging smoke footprint extended uh, significantly. Um, and this informs the evacuation, the additional living expenses and the contents claim portions of our vulnerability module. And it is very important. Um, so once fire hazard is calculated, the model uh, determines how much damage is caused to the structure based on the intensity of that hazard. 
So Daniel's going to highlight some of the great work that IBHS is doing to understand wildfire vulnerability and build more resilient fire safe communities based on the outcomes of that research. So before I hand it over to him, I just wanted to end uh, with some thoughts on where we go from here in wildfire mitigation. There is justifiably a lot of talk going on about safety and mitigation and community planning in the context of wildfire, in the wake of these very large losses that we have seen. This is a very good thing, but I think it's very important that everyone recognize wildfire risk mitigation is truly a team sport. Homeowners bear the responsibility of good home maintenance. Land planning has to face the reality of elevated fire risk uh, in new construction. Regulators, uh, we need to carry the torch of enforcement and creating a legal framework to make all of this work. And insurers, uh, there is lots of opportunity for mitigation credits like they have been developed in other perils like wind and hail um, to be able to incentivize better fire safe behavior and penalize uh, uh, behavior as well uh, to be able to improve wildfire safety and resiliencies. So all parties need to play a role to reduce the risk. Um, and I think that is an important part of the overall wildfire apparel message. Thank you very much. And now I am pleased to hand it over to Daniel, who's going to go into a little more detail on the vulnerability side of wildfire. Thanks, Chris. Um, good morning and afternoon to everyone. This is Daniel Gorham from IBHS. As Chris introduced myself, I am a research engineer um, just a, a little bit of background for those of you not as familiar, IBHS is a nonprofit organization that, that looks at the impact of natural perils on the built environment, and we look at four natural perils, wind, wind-driven rain, hail, and wildfire, and, and that's my focus areas on wildfire, and so um, that's what I'd like to speak to you all about today. Um, and what I have here on a slide is actually, um, Chris and I coordinated these, but I think that this is maybe would have been better somewhere earlier on. But um, the question at the top poses, how did this happen? And, and the picture is um, from the Angora fire in 2007 in South Lake Tahoe. Um, and, and the question that I'm asking is, how do we have a home, it was a building um, that was completely burned down. And at this point, we see just the chimney standing. Um, we see fire hoses on the ground. So there was some amount of response, um, but we also see green vegetation fairly close to the home, um, but the home is destroyed, the building is destroyed. And so um, this fire in 2007 and, and others like it in the 21st century um, really prompted the need um, from the insurance industry to, to better understand this. Um, and that's where IBHS roles come in um, with our research facility. We're able to, to recreate these perils and understand them. And so um, th this picture right here is a really good, again, motivator for, for the work that we've done up to this point that I'll talk about today and what we continue to do going forward. Uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about in this slide deck is the building ignition mechanisms. And um, I'm actually gonna pause because I'm not able to progress the slides. Thank you. Um, so building ignition mechanisms, and, and there are three of them. Um, and the first one is direct flame contact. And I have some nice animations here, kindly donated by a PhD student. Um, the, the direct flame contact is when that wall of flame from the spreading wildfire um, comes in direct contact with the building, the home or the business. Um, and this flame is at temperatures in excess of a thousand degrees. And we know that flames can cause ignitions of other fuels, siding and roofs. Um, and, and so that's one way that buildings can ignite via direct flame contact from either vegetation burning around or other combustibles like debris and, and lawn furniture. Um, the second ignition mechanism is radiative heat transfer. And this is when the flame isn't in direct contact with the building, um, but through radiative heat transfer, the same way the sun heats up the earth, um, that the heat can travel through space and with a big wall of flames and with, with high enough temperatures, um, radiative heat transfer can cause enough heating of the material to lead to ignition. And um, we've actually found that uh, the, the radiative heat transfer um, can be mitigated by, by some separation distance. So we'll talk about defensible space. Um, but for a long time, radiative heat transfer was the, the mechanism that we thought 
was leading to most boating ignitions. But the third ignition mechanism here, embers, as, as Chris alluded to and provided some great pictures of, um, is another important mechanism and, and we believe is, is a leading mechanism. Some studies have shown that up to 90% of buildings that are ignited and destroyed from wildland fires and wooey fires, um, they have been ignited from embers. And so embers are really the focus here of, of what the IBHS is looking at, the building component vulnerability. And I think one more click of the slide will give a little emphasis on embers of the three ignition mechanisms, embers being an important one. And, and I wanted to start with this because this will be a backdrop, these three ignition mechanisms um, for the later discussion that I'll have about building components, how they are vulnerable and recommendations to mitigate against that vulnerability. So just to give some uh, picture examples of this, um, but I think Chris really teed me up with some good examples before, um, but this is a picture where um, the building was ignited likely from direct flame contact and the arrow indicates the path of fire spread up the slope um, to the building. Uh, next, we have a, a likely ignition due to radiation, and this is from um, a fire in Tennessee, a uh, part of the United States that is not as well known for wildfire maybe as California, um, but this is from a fire where this is a log cabin, and the picture on the left shows you at a, a starting time, um, some of the neighboring cabins are ignited, and then just a short while later, minutes, the picture on the right shows you that same cabin that had ignited, and um, this big wall of flame here where the, the whole house is burning, um, that creates enough of that energy we talked about for radiative heat transfer to ignite a building. And then the third, the third ignition mechanism that again I emphasized already would be embers, and also known as firebrands. And here we actually break the ember ignition into two different categories. We have a direct ember ignition shown on the left where embers impact the, the combustible siding or material deck. Um, and the embers, those hot particles, can get right up against there and through conduction can, can cause that ignition. So that would be a direct ember ignition of a building. Um, but on the right, we see embers can not necessarily land on the combustible uh, materials, but they land on some combustibles near the building, like debris on the ground or mulch in your landscape. And then the resulting flames from that burning mulch that was ignited by the embers leads to ignition of the building. And so uh, it's a little bit of an in-between step, but it's, it's really dependent on the ember that ignited that mulch which led to the ignition of the building. So uh, ember ignition being important, um, but thinking about both direct and indirect. So uh, this slide, I'll just kind of give an overview of some of the building components that I'm going to talk about today. And this is a, this is a highlight reel, if you will. Um, IBHS has done a series of uh, research projects, both on our own and in collaboration with other groups, including the US Forest Service and NIST National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, to look at these and other building components and their vulnerability. Um, but here I'm going to talk about vents and the roof uh, deck and fence and siding materials, but um, the, the research that I'll talk about here is supported by um, work that we published in IBHS and peer-reviewed reports, um, which are available on our website, ibhs.org. So the first component I'll talk about here is vents um, and using the same building uh, animation here, um, pointing out the variety of vents that can exist on a building. Um, starting from the top of the roof and going down through roof vents, typically at the ridge or known as ridge vents, gable vents on the gable side of the house, under eave vents where buildings have eaves, and then closer to the ground in, in areas where you might have a basement or a underfloor foundation and other vents. And these are all vents that during normal operation are, are important for the building because they allow the inlet and outlet of air, um, which is important for moisture management and uh, energy efficiencies. Um, but during a wildfire, they pose a vulnerability and a pathway um, for the flames and the embers to enter the building and, and possibly lead to an ignition. So, so one of the reasons that vem, ember, or pardon me, vents pose a, a vulnerability is because, again, they're intended to allow the passage of air. Um, there's typically a gap, and this is a great area for debris to accumulate. And, and here I have a picture of a ridge vent um, with 
pine needle debris accumulated. Um, and, and this is a vulnerability because in this same location where the pine needles drop from the trees and get blown by the wind and they tend to want to get stuck there is the same type of location where an ember during a wildfire exposure might want to land um, and, and ignite. And, and this would be a case where if an ember ignited that debris, uh, the flames would maybe impact that vent and, and that's how we would get fire spread to the building. So vents here on the ridge were not typically as concerned with radiation or flame, but um, this is an entry point for embers into the building and in that attic space where there might be combustibles. And here we have a picture um, from some experiments testing done at IBHS, and this is the, the same facility that, that Chris had shown. Um, and we're looking here at the gable end vent. And so uh, this is showing ember entry. On the left-hand side, we see um, the ember generator shooting embers at the gable end side of the house where we have a vent. Um, you can see that's a pretty severe exposure, um, but we've seen from videos and pictures taken during wildland fire and wooey fire events that this is a representative. This is what it looks like out there during a wildfire um, impacting the community. And then on the right, this is a picture taken during the same experiment um, showing you looking at the vent from inside the attic, how the embers are able to enter. Um, and on the ground there is actually a piece of uh, batten cloth cotton um, to show that's a susceptible fuel what embers can land on. And um, I, I'll take a second here to say that while vents are vulnerable to ember entry, um, there are ways that you can mitigate, homeowners and business owners can mitigate against that entry. And that's typically done um, with a screening or a, a ember proof or ember resistant vent. Um, metal screening typically sold in quarter inch or eighth inch size mesh um, can prevent the larger particles, the larger embers that, you know, get blown at the vent from entering the building. Uh, it won't completely prevent everything from entering. You will still get embers inside. Um, but we found that the smaller vents, and our preference is a eighth inch mesh screening, um, reduces the size of embers that are able to enter into the building. And those smaller embers um, have a lower likelihood or lower probability of igniting susceptible fuels in the building. So the, the next building component that I'll talk about here is the roof. And again, um, on the left-hand side, we see an image where we have some debris accumulation on the roof. Um, and this is an interesting picture to talk about a little bit. The picture on the right shows a, a similar type setup in our facility um, where that debris had ignited. And again, this is a good picture to show um, the, the roof building component, uh, that, that roof field um, on a lot of residential. We have asphalt shingles, but also metal roofs and tile roofs. Um, it's not just the field of the roof. And in this case, we have a dormer on a residential structure and that dormer has the, the siding material, the sidewall, and it creates a crevice there where um, the vertical wall meets the horizontal roof. And we see again, that's a great place for accumulation of debris and embers to ignite. Um, but it creates a, a kind of a change in the vulnerability of the building component where not only is the roof field being exposed to the fire, um, but the siding material that's on that dormer is being exposed. And so um, we found this to be a particular vulnerability. And our guidance and recommendation here is to, to make sure that this area is clear of vegetation and debris buildup that might have you know, accumulated. So getting up on your roof um, several times a year to clean that out is important. Um, another thing that you can do or homeowners and business owners can do is in these locations where the debris and the embers might accumulate is to use a, a non-combustible barrier essentially like a metal flashing right there at that crevice where the, the dormer wall and the roof meet. Um, so if embers were to accumulate there, they're not necessarily sitting on the roofing material or in direct contact with the siding, um, but there's some metal flashing that's um, inherently non-combustible and um, would resist ignition differently than here we have cedar siding and asphalt shingles. I uh, talked about other types of roofs, including tile roofs and um, tile roofs, which are typically non-combustible. They're made out of a ceramic material. Um, the, the design and the, and the way they're built um, creates a different kind of vulnerability, and it's highlighted on the left-hand side, um, a little bit of a, a gap you see between each of the tiles, a crevice area. And again, to you know, really hit the point home that those crevice areas and those gaps are, are ideal locations for embers to enter and accumulate. Um, and that ember entry and accumulation 
um, can result in if there's combustibles underneath or debris accumulated um, flaming. So on the left hand side we see at that, that ridge area where the tiles have a gap and on the right hand side we see um, at the barrel end of the tile roof um, where there might be a gap. I will say that um, this picture was taken not um, during a, it was taken during a process where a homeowner was actually filling that gap. You see the, the left three tiles are filled with uh, uh, a bird stopping material and um, the, the, the researcher, the IBHS staff that took this picture just happened to take it at the right time. Um, but this is a good demonstration of one of the things that can be done to mitigate this is um, here it's a, with a, it's a mud material or a clay material, um, but it's referred to as bird stopping to prevent birds and, and animals from getting up in there. But it also does a good job of preventing debris accumulation in that area and preventing ember entry into that area. So uh, another uh, component of the roof or attachments to the roof at the roof edge, and here we show gutters. Uh, most residential structures, a lot of them have gutters um, to divert rainfall or water that gets on the roof from, from falling directly down and puts it away from the home. Um, on the left-hand side, we see a gutter attached to um, an asphalt shingle roof, and we see the debris accumulation there. So again, kind of reinforcing the importance of um, maintaining buildings, not just with building components that are inherently wildfire resistant, um, but maintaining them and removing debris that can be ignited. Um, the, a little bit of background on the picture on the left, this gutter actually has a gutter guard system um, that prevents that debris from getting inside the gutter. It's essentially a mesh screen that prevents those pine needles from sitting inside of it, um, but it doesn't stop the pine needles from landing on it. And so instead of the pine needles falling inside the gutter, they just sit on that top of the of the gutter guard there. And in this case, if we, we turn the picture, if we were able to rotate a little bit, we'd see that the uh, debris is right up at that drip edge. Um, and so that debris ignited um, could lead to fire exposure. And the picture on the right shows exactly that. And the picture on the right also shows um, the difference between a metal gutter and a vinyl gutter. And, and on the left-hand side, you see the gutter burning and falling down. That is a vinyl gutter. Um, with debris inside that ignited. And, and one of the concerns and particular vulnerabilities with that vinyl gutter is not only does it expose the, the fire to the roof there, um, but if and when it does eventually fall to the ground, that vinyl might still burn and a burning plastic like that creates a, a pretty intense fire that would be, in this case, right adjacent to the exterior wall. So moving down the house and looking at the eave area, um, here we have pictures of two typical eave designs. Um, the open eave design shown on the left, and you see the vent holes there, which are important to get that ventilation in and out of the attic area. Um, but as we talked about before, those vents are an entry point, not only for embers, but the under eave area, if there was debris on the ground and that started to burn, flames would get caught up into that under eave area. And this open eave creates a little bit of a cavity, a cocoon almost, um, for the flames to sit there. And then those vents not only potentially allow embers to enter, but the flame could burn through and into the attic space. And on the right-hand side, we see another common eave design, a softened or boxed-in eave design. While this allows the ventilation necessary for the attic space, um, that, that horizontal barrier, that boxed-in um, creates a little bit more resistance to potential flames. Um, and we've done some research to look at the vulnerability of vents to ember entry and have seen that the softwooded eaves are a little bit more resistant to ember entry. Um, so, so going on to some other building components, here's a picture of siding. Um, and this is actually a picture taken from a recent event um, at IBHS to demonstrate for our members um, wildfire resistance and vulnerabilities. And, and so this is, a, this is a demonstration to show the difference between cedar shingle siding, so wood siding, which is combustible, and that's kind of what you're seeing in the, in the picture there with the burnt siding. Um, and again, uh, if, I, if I could rotate the picture, the other side of that inside corner is, uh, is siding that is fiber cement board, which is a non-combustible siding. And, and we had the same fire exposure. That's a pile of, of wood cribs burning on the ground. You can think of that as simulating or emulating some burning degree on the, brown, on the ground. 
right next to the building. Um, but the non-combustible siding, while it gets charred and damaged a little bit, doesn't carry the fire, vertical fire spread and the lateral, lateral fire spread like the uh, cedar shingle siding does. Um, another thing I want to point out in this picture, um, this next picture also shows well, is that there's actually a little bit of a gap on the ground where the bottom of the siding um, would typically run all the way or might run all the way down to the ground. And what we've done here is actually introduced a six inch gap um, so even if you have a combustible siding, creating a little bit of a gap for the, where the ground intersects with the siding um, creates a little bit of a barrier. So for ember accumulation, you can see some um, resistance there. Um, and the picture on the right um, is showing gels, some fire retardant gels, which are products available to um, enhance the wildfire resistance of building materials and particularly sidings. Um, and so we've done some testing to look at these. Um, the middle picture there shows you the same siding material um, the, the siding on the left had the fire retardant gels applied and the siding on the right did not have it applied. Um, and so we've seen some you know, benefits of, of these gels, um, but I do want to point out that, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And the image on the far right here shows you that same siding with the gels applied. Um, but you can see on the underneath, right there at the bottom edge of that wood siding, there's a little bit of the wood siding that's exposed and not covered in the gel. And so if there was a fire there, and, and you could see on the left a little bit, that's where the fire eventually was able to ignite. So um, siding is an important building component, and we recommend non-combustible siding like fiber cement board, which can be uh, made into the, the color and the aesthetics that you want, um, provides the wildfire resistance. And then uh, inside the exterior walls are windows. Um, and this is a pretty straightforward uh, slide to talk about is that uh, windows become vulnerable when they heat up and the glass breaks again, entry point for flames and embers. Um, and so what we found is multi-pane windows, which are very common um, now for energy efficiency of buildings, multi-pane windows provide um, more wildfire resistance in the same way that they maintain the temperature inside of the home or the building. Um, they can you know, keep out the heat energy outside like from a wildfire. And window screens, um, here we have some uh, uh, plastic screens essentially. Um, screens can actually be good at keeping embers from getting in. Um, they kind of, embers kind of hit up against them and bounce right off the same way we have screening for vents. Um, but non-combustible or rather combustible screens like the one shown on the right here don't hold up well to flames and fire and they can melt quite easily. So um, it's using metal screens, metal mesh screens for your windows and making sure that the windows, the glass or the tempered glazing behind them are closed is really important. And then some of the attachments to the building like decks. Um, this is a, an experiment to show how decks can be vulnerable to embers. The image on the left is showing you kind of a big view and the image on the right is a zoomed in showing that the embers can accumulate on that deck board and lead to that direct ember ignition. And then if we get a burning deck that might be directly attached to the home, that's a pretty intense fire that can lead to ignition of the building. And not only decks are they vulnerable to the, the embers on top, um, but again, to, to hit a point home for debris accumulation, perhaps underneath that can be ignited by embers, this flame underneath the deck um, can, can create this under deck fire exposure and lead to ignition of the deck there. So again, importance of maintenance and removing debris on and around your home. Fences similar to decks, um, create accumulation points for embers and fire spread directly to the home. And so one of our recommendations is to either use an entirely non-combustible like metal fence, um, or if you have a wooden fence in that critical area where it attaches to the home, um, making it non-combustible. Um, and the reason for this is because the fence, um, if it burns is, you know, unfortunate loss, but if it is connected directly to the home and is able to carry the fire to the building, um, that, that ember or that fire spread to the building could lead to a, to a greater loss. And so um, fences are inherently vulnerable, um, but can be made of non-combustible like metal materials. And then finally wrapping up here, talking about uh, a term that I think most people that are in the wildfire resistance and wildfire risk reduction space are familiar with, defensible space. Um, and here we look particularly at the near building zone. Um, this is zero to five feet from 
around the building and entirely underneath. And, and this captures, again, the idea of the importance of removing combustibles like mulch and debris accumulation um, from away from the home that would lead to that indirect ember ignition. So the image on the left showing um, debris on the ground ignited by embers that are now burning up against the home. And the image on the right is showing a picture from some research that we conducted to actually verify and kind of get some confidence behind the appropriateness of should it be a three foot non-combustible zone or seven foot. Um, and that report again, as I mentioned, is available on IBHS.org. And then here, putting it all together, um, this is a picture from a recent demonstration we conducted to kind of look at all of those building components, the roof, the siding, the eaves, the near building zone, the decks, um, and kind of give you an apples to apples comparison. So what we did, this is a 30 foot wide building that split down the middle duplex style. And on the left hand side of this picture where you see fire, we use traditional building components. So open eaves and combustible siding and mulch on the ground. And on the right hand side, we use the wildfire resistant counterpart. So non-combustible siding, enclosed eaves, rock mulch on the ground, and a six inch vertical gap for the siding. Um, and we see, well, both of these sides of the homes of the building are exposed to embers. Um, the difference in resistance to ember ignition, and um, this is about five minutes into the test. And um, for those of you that haven't seen this already, you might be interested to go and see some video clips from this to, to show the full test. And I think it's really impactful to see the difference between traditional building construction materials and components and wildfire resistance and how they perform to a realistic ember exposure. And then finally, um, having talked about a lot of building components, I, one of the things we at IBHS are cognizant of is um, while there are wildfire resistant components, there may be resistance to, to implement them and use them because of the cost. And so this is just a simple slide taken from a recent report with uh, Headwaters Economics to show that um, the cost of wildfire resistant home is similar um, to a traditional home. And so, um, Wildfire resistance and resilience for buildings is affordable um, for all, and then that's what we hope to do with the work that IBHS is doing, um, supported by our members like RMS and others, um, to make it available to home and business owners and, and usable by the insurance industry. Great. Well, thank you very much for that, Daniel. And uh, now I guess you and I can sort of uh, open up the floor to some questions. Again, we are going to be looking at the Q&A panel, so you can click on the Q&A um, and we will try to just take uh, answers there. So uh, we will start uh, at the very top and try to move very quickly. Um, so the first question is some people will try to hunker down and ride out a hurricane, but I get the sense most people will evacuate when a wildfire approaches. Uh, I would say, yes, it is not recommended to hunker down in a hurricane and it is not recommended to hunker down in a wildfire. Um, uh, I would say certainly evacu mandatory evacuation orders uh, are very common in wildfire. Uh, that's a, a very important part of modeling because you know, in insurance modeling, it leads to additional living expenses, which can be uh, significant. For example, in the Woolsey fire in Malibu last year, 260,000 people were evacuated. So when you have that volume of evacuation, it causes a lot of disruption, can cause some business interruption and additional living expense claims. Um, so there is a lot of evacuation and uh, we would never recommend that you ignore an evacuation order because dying in a wildfire is one of the worst ways you can go. Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll take a first stab at, uh, do you have data sets insurers can use to determine the vulnerability of specific building, construction types, defensible space, et cetera? Um, and I'll just speak um, from IDHS's perspective to talk about, again, the work that we do. Um, we do publish uh, research reports that are uh, generally publicly available, but uh, one additional benefit to member companies is um, additional products like the data sets that we have. So, um, and to direct answer to this question, question in some cases, yes, um, but, but in some cases, those data sets are a little bit more proprietary. So, um, for the questioner, please reach out to myself or someone at IBHS for more information. Sure, yeah, and I, and I would just add to that, uh, taking the great research that IBHS does and putting it into our models, 
um, you know, the, the things that Daniel just talked to you about with, uh, with venting and roofs and gutters and siding and defensible space, those are all dials on our model. So you can take uh, your portfolios, put them through our model for 50,000 years of wildfire simulation and see what's the financial loss, what's the financial impact to me from using a better roof versus worse, worse roof, from using a gutter with debris compared to a gutter with no debris and get a very, very nuanced, sophisticated view of the payoffs of certain types of safety measures. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, the, the IBH uh, research stuff you've just seen is making a demonstrable impact in the insurance industry. Um, the uh, next, oh, I think I might have, I think I might have uh, accidentally uh, uh, disrupted. Oh, so the next one is climate change is a big player for the increase of wildfire. Do you capture this? If so, how do you capture this in your model? I'd say yes, climate change is a contributor to what we believe we're seeing in, in increased severity and uh, increased uh, fire loss. Um, and uh, in, in our models, we do take this into account, uh, both uh, explicitly through sort of the sampling of the data that we do in our climate simulation, as well as implicitly in uh, the distribution of fire sizes, making sure that what we model <coughs> represents the, the 2019 fire size distribution accurately. Um, now, most of climate change as we know it uh, has happened since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so um, we, we adequately capture uh, climate change so far. Now, what we don't capture is climate change 10 years into the future, because we as modelers do not predict the future. But if something changes in terms of our current climate regime, we will recalibrate the models accordingly. Uh, I, I have a quick uh, answer to a <clears throat> brief question here. Uh, prior to the last slide, please comment on the color coding for cost of wildfire resistant constructions. And I believe this was, was my slide. Um, the color coding used on the slide um, is, is proportional to, or is a similar scheme used for the full report. Um, you can find the report on IBHS's website. It's actually published and hosted by Headwaters Economics, just to Google search for cost of wildfire resistant construction. Um, and it shows you the different colors and the that we know. Great. Can you elaborate on how you captured ember travel in your model? Um, yes. So uh, embers are uh, a function of the fuel that's burning, the ambient moisture in the environment, uh, and the wind conditions. Um, so that's all. The, the moisture and the wind are part of our 50,000-year uh, climate simulation. The fuel is read off a land fire grid uh, of 50-meter resolution. Um, and, and embers travel uh, downwind. Uh, the first research was done in the 1940s. A lot of sophisticated equations were developed in the 1970s. We leveraged and <clears throat> retrofitted some of those, uh, uh, some of those methodologies. Um, we calibrated them to claims data that we, uh, that we collected. Um, and we also, part of ember modeling is urban conflagration modeling, when houses burn and the fire jumps house to house. And, and vegetation is no longer burning. And we have a very sophisticated urban conflagration model that takes into account stuff like exposure density, the built upness, uh, street width, fire suppression, and stuff like that. So a lot of our effort went into the ember side of the model. Um, the next question is really easy. Uh, when is underwriting model of RMS being released? Can you talk about its features? Yes, we'll have a lot of a downstream underwriting data available as part of this model. It's being released very soon. Please reach out directly to us and we can get you more details on that. When will the recording and slides become available? Shortly after this presentation, you will get both the recording and the slides. So stay tuned for that. Um, let's see, now I'm, now I'm reading these live as they come in. Right here, I think it would be appropriate to ask about longer lasting embers. What do you think creates longer lasting or more effective embers, igniting houses or wildland fuel? Uh, you may have seen some of this evidence in your simulation. I would say the type of fuel being burned 
If you have big chunks of fuel, pine cone size embers, and, it, and the moisture is very low, then, then the wind can carry them very, very, very far uh, without them burning out. So if you have the right kind of fuel and the right kind of moisture uh, and, and really intense winds, that's when you have successful embers. And when you have a lot of them, you know, the, the stuff that Daniel showed you, that's when you have a lot of ember, high concentration of embers, and any one of them can cause an ignition. So you, you have... Sorry, Chris, for stepping over you. No, no, go for it. I was just going to add, yeah, we, we've looked at that a bit um, and, and found the difference in ember size and shape from vegetation and structural fuels. And I think that that's um, something that can and it probably is um, incorporated in these models. Great. And what do, you, oops, what do you see for changes to the wildfire models that drive reinsurance? I mean, broadly speaking, we believe that uh, the difference between a safe house and, or a, a safe fire resistant house in a good territory and a dangerous fire susceptible house in a bad territory, we do not believe today the good houses are getting sufficient credit and the bad houses are getting sufficient penalty. Uh, the models indicate that there are uh, much wider differences than the market is currently pricing for. And that is going to impact both insurance, reinsurance, and insurance linked securities. So I think there will be big changes coming that way over the next couple of uh, fire seasons. Uh, a question about the, my comment about gels. Um, question is, can that gel coating be something applied by the homeowner before leaving a property? Um, the answer to that question is yes, but I will point out that um, some recent work that we've done to look at the performance of the gels over time when exposed to the low relative humidities and high winds typical of a wildfire, we've seen that, um, that the performance decreases with time. And our actual recommendation is because of the short amount of time that the gels can maintain their, their fire resistance, um, we actually recommend that um, homeowners, because of potential complications with applying it, really focus on um, life safety and evacuating when ordered to do so um, and not worry so much about using the gel coatings. There's usage for properly trained personnel, um, but again, because of concerns with uh, life safety, the, the priority should be that. Great. Um, and we have one question. What is the average cost to retrofit existing homes? It's a pretty broad question. I'm not even going to attempt it. Daniel? <laughs> Um, we did look at that a bit in the uh, the Headwaters Economics Report I've mentioned, and for some of you, I've, I've tried to use the Zoom type answer to provide you a link to that, but um, I can for sure include that with the distribution after this. Um, but we did look at retrofitting. Um, it, it, it can be costly, um, but I will point out that there are other things for existing buildings that home and business owners can do to increase the wildfire resistance, like creating and maintaining defensible space um, for the siding materials, if you can't replace a completely combustible siding, um, replacing or removing the bottom six inches to be non-combustible um, can have enhanced benefits. Great. I think we have time for uh, three or four more questions. Um, uh, well, the next one is quick. Uh, Anonymous asks, does the RMS wildfire model provide return period guidance for the 2017 or 2018 losses in California? And the answer is yes, the RMS model does. Contact us for more details. Um, the next one, uh, during a call yesterday, someone talked about all the dead trees resulting from Hurricane Michael and the resulting fire hazard reaction. Is this kind of exposure being modeled? I would say yes, we are not at the point with uh, computational capacity that we can model individual tree level exposure. But implicitly, uh, uh, you know, I think that the fuel maps are updated every couple of years and dead trees and that, those kind of fuel loadings should result in more intense and or bigger fires. And so to the extent that we are uh, calibrating our model um, to uh, fire size distributions that we are looking at over uh, short and long periods of time, we should be capturing that aspect of the risk. Um, 
The next question, the home in Washington that survived the wildfire, what were the characteristics that served, that allowed it serve, to survive? I mean, you can see that that picture, that, that home had a metal roof. They got that going for them. But really, the characteristics that allowed it to survive, I believe, were more about the characteristics of the fire, not the characteristics of the home. And the wind changed directions at exactly the right time. Lucky homeowner. Uh, but I think to the extent that there were flying embers uh, uh, that, that uh, landed on or near the roof, that could have played a big factor because that was a metal roof. Uh, other parts of that, uh, that home, like the vegetation around the structure uh, and the deck that was attached to the house, um, were not great in terms of uh, uh, fire risk. Um, so that, that house was a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, so I will go to, uh, how should insurers and reinsurers price wildfire risk? I'm an underwriter by trade. I love those kind of questions. And I would say price to the true underlying exposure. Uh, use as many models and, and as much data and as many analytics as you can possibly get your hand on and give credit for where credit is due on home safety and mitigation, um, as well as the other way around, price for fire susceptibility. Um, so we have time for one more question. It's the top of the hour. Um, Daniel, would you like to choose one out? We have, by the way, we have more questions than we can get to. Uh, we have over 30 open questions at this point. We are going to take these questions. We have your name, unless you submitted it anonymously, and we are going to respond to you via email after this call. Um, so in the meantime, um, uh, one more question. Um, how about, uh, I believe that newer homes built after 2009 are required to have sprinklers. Is this taken into account in your modeling? Yes, in regions that requirement is in place. And we do take that into account in our model. Uh, vulnerability banding is 2009 or after in our model. So if you run two houses that are exactly identical and one of them was built in 2011 and one of them was built in 2007 in the right regions, yes, you are going to see a difference from that model. So with that, I want to thank you very much uh, for uh, showing up to today's call. It was a great attendance. Um, I think we covered a lot of material. We are going to make the slides available as well as a recording of this webinar available uh, very soon. We'll follow up with an email if you registered. Um, and if you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to either Daniel or myself. Thank you very much.